people often assume Jack's on the spectrum because he's nonverbal and has some rocking behaviors. I don't correct people necessarily, but I often will say, oh, Jack's actually not autistic. He's got a disease called adrenaleukodystrophy. Your feet. Come here. Come here. Oh, here you go. Feel better? Jack is 21. Uh, no. His sense of humor is rather sophisticated. It's not childish. That's the look you're going for today? Look in the mirror, tell me. Yeah, that's good. That's good, should we button another button maybe? His ability is very different. He's like an 18 month old. He can walk from A to B, but he can't do anything for himself along the way. He's a 21 year old who's got a lot of challenges that don't make sense because nature's weird and mean. Jack is a very quiet, <laughs> but very lovable person. He's louder than many people think, despite not being able to talk. Our relationship is probably a lot easier than most 19-year-olds with their 21-year-old brother. Most people don't understand Jack and are kind of confused by him or uncomfortable around him. I was six years old when Jack was diagnosed and I turned seven when he was in the hospital. I don't really remember a time beforehand. Like I can't remember a time when he talked. Jack was in first grade doing very well. He was a very typical kid. He was happy. He was reading and writing. We went through a series of different stages when he was seven uh, and then eight where we couldn't really figure out what was going on with him. And he wasn't super hyperactive and wasn't unruly, but had an extremely difficult time staying on any task. This summer before second grade, he was constantly in trouble. He would get in trouble for like having no filter with like curse words or whatever. And he would always come home from school with like a big ring around his neck that was wet because he'd be chewing on his shirt all day, every day. It was just like, that was one of the first habits. And then it devolved to, you know, Jesse be getting him ready to go to school and she'd say, you know, put your clothes on. She'd walk out of the room and he was like half naked. She'd walk back in the room 10 minutes later, he was still standing there. He'd go days without speaking. I'd find him in his room staring at a wall, kind of lost. It went from quirky to scary, quickly. By like January of his second grade year, he could barely write his name. We were very fortunate that his teacher intervened. She was the one who pushed us, which was very brave of her to stick out and become his advocate. She trusted us and we trusted her. She could show us the degradation and she was concerned about his health. Oh, she was tremendous and quite frankly, she helped save his life. I was calling doctors. There were waiting lists of months and months and months. And a doctor that had been really recommended called me on a Saturday. And it's always bad when doctors are willing to call you on a Saturday afternoon, particularly a doctor you've never seen or paid or anything. His teacher had sent a file of Jack's information to him. And he said he had looked at Jack's file and he was extremely concerned and that Jack needed to have an MRI. We were told within moments of his MRI that there was something significant going on in his brain. They weren't sure what. 
So they started testing for a lot of things. It was 10 days before they finally figured it out. They sat Jesse and I down in a small room. It was really claustrophobic in there because they had all these little chairs set up. It was just the two of us sitting on a couch. There were all these people introducing themselves. The neurology team, that made sense. But then it was a transplant team. And there was a geneticist in there. And then there was a social worker, which seemed like not somebody I needed. And they explained to us that he had adrenal leukodystrophy, and we said, what's that? Scratch. There. Scratch. Dad's going to love that one. You want to send it to him? We had two choices. They said we could either take him home and keep him as comfortable as possible for a year and change and he would probably die. Or we could get a stem cell transplant and the goal of that would be to not cure the disease, but to stop the progression of the disorder. Um, and I think it took us about 20 seconds to just say, okay, well, let's do that. We'll take door number two and how and when can we do that? Assuming that a transplant is successful, which in Jack's case it was, it is a race against time. So it was a 10-day regimen of hardcore chemotherapy. They were wiping him out bit by bit. The stem cells they were introducing into his body needed to be accepted. The biggest issue really was whether or not he would survive the transplant. So his immune system was really compromised. He was, he was weak and he was in a lot of pain and there was all kinds of stuff that could have gone wrong. Before that, I had been focusing on stupid things like he missed the end of second grade. How is he going to catch up in school? And then all those things were slipping by and then the reality of like, I, I don't think we're going to bring him home and how's that going to be? A family of four turning into a family of three. It was hard, but then it was like a few weeks later that those times were fewer and they started talking about us going home again, which they hadn't for a while. Come on. One. Push. Two. Push. Ta-da. When we brought him home, we felt in our hearts that we were gonna get Jack back the way that felt familiar to us. But the reality set in quickly Things like he wasn't speaking, but we attributed that to he had mouth sores from all the chemotherapy. Well, he is in diapers, but it's because he had so many GI issues. We kind of thought it would all resolve, but as the time was going by, it became more and more apparent that it was a new normal. You ready? Let me just get you here. Come here. All right. Okay. It's Help stuck. your sister out, okay? It's Come stuck. here. Come here. There you go. Okie doke. Mustache, shaving face. Come on, shaving face. Shaving face. Come on. There you go. Help her out. Oh. Gotcha. We know it doesn't hurt. You're not fooling anybody. <laughs> We found a great special school. It kind of made us feel like we had found our people. And when people newly diagnosed with ALD started reaching out to me, 
that was a huge turning point because I felt like we were on the other side of it. Teachers, age, therapists, it, it does take a village. And when you live through something like this, you actually understand what that means. It's not just a cheap tagline. You, you can't do it alone. He's just like you and I, comprehension-wise. He's, he's just cannot communicate. If you don't know him and you don't know his, what he's able to do, you might think he can't read, he can't do this, he can't do that. So my job is to show people, yes, he can. Right? Yes. He's loud. He just is. Once you get to know him, you forget the fact he can't speak. He's part of the conversation often leading the conversation. I know all parents feel like their kid's special, but there is something magical about him. Honestly, he's amazing. Jack's taught us a lot about living at his speed, but if you slow down, you realize how much you've been missing. Boys who are diagnosed with ALD today have more options than they did in 2007. There's a better network now, thanks to social media, thanks to the community. Whether it's ALD or something else, find people that understand where you are and can appreciate what you're going through. Because once you're part of the community, I feel like it makes us all stronger against the disease.